Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar on adolescent health and the climate crisis in the Asia Pacific region. So this is a critical topic at the intersection of health and environmental issues that increasingly impact young people in our region. Today, we'll explore these issues and how our community can contribute to solutions. So my name is Stephanie Partridge, and I'm a, uh, one of the co-chairs of the International Association for Adolescent Health Emerging Professionals Network, and I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Sydney. Today, I'm dialing in from the beautiful lands of the Gadigal people here in Sydney. So the health of our natural environment, fresh water, land animals, marine animals, and people are intimately connected. I'd like to acknowledge this and that Aboriginal people as the first protectors have continuously cared for country and the natural environment for thousands of generations. I acknowledge the custodians and honour the ancestors, the elders both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal people or Indigenous people that are joining us today. So the Emerging Professionals Network brings together students, trainees and early career professionals from across the globe, all dedicated to improving adolescent health. If you're within 10 years of your field, we welcome you to join our community. It's a vibrant, collaborative space for learning, leading and networking. Here are my wonderful co-chairs, Diana, Mellis and Molly. Our team also includes a um, dynamic group of officers who are instrumental in keeping our network active and engaged. Our webinars cover a wide range of topics relevant to students, trainees and emerging professionals in adolescent health. We're committed to bringing you fresh insights and perspectives on the most pressing, pressing issues in the field. If you can't join us live, don't worry, all of our webinars are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to our two moderators for today's webinar, Surabi Dogra and Jeremy Maravilla. So Surabi is an officer of the IAAH EPN from India. She is also a youth commissioner of the second Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. Her areas of interest include adolescent health, environmental and digital health, youth engagement and communications. Jeremy Maravilla is also an officer of the IAAH EPN. He is a psychiatric epidemiologist and a public health specialist originally from the Philippines and is now based in Australia at the University of Queensland. His work encompasses teenage pregnancy, complex mental health needs, domestic and family violence and substance use and uh, justice health. Jeremy also has a strong research interest in adolescent reproductive health through mental health risks and mental health integration in primary care in low resource settings. So thank you so much, Surabi and Jeremy, and over to you both. Thanks so much, Stephanie, for that introduction and setting the context for this webinar today. And I just want to start with a quick shout out to our amazing organizing team, some of, some of us behind the camera and in front of the camera, Steph, Molly, Joma, Tomiba, EPN co-chairs, officers, and a huge thanks to all the EPN community members that are joining us today. So thank you so much for joining us. Now, at the IWH EPN, we've been organizing a lot of global webinars. This is one of our first attempts at organizing regional webinars as we move towards mobilizing regional efforts for advancing adolescent health in the region. Now, the purpose is for us to come together as the adolescent health community in this region, emerging professionals and experts to collectively address uh, the health impact of the climate crisis on adolescents of the region. Our collective power, the power of intergenerational dialogue and the power of working together is crucial to tackle this crisis. We hope that this will be the first of many platforms where we can not only share common yet unique concerns of adolescents of the region, but also learn from each other's experiences and best practices at a regional level. To mark World Environmental Health Day, which was on September 26th this week, what could be a better way to start this effort than to discuss one of the most pressing issues facing the region, that is climate crisis. This year's WEHD theme is resilient communities through disaster risk reduction and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Now, whichever country you're joining us from today in the region, when I say disasters, unfortunately, you will be able to think of a recent or an ongoing disaster in your country. The Asia-Pacific region is witness to a wide range of consequences of a changing climate. This region also has more than half of the global population of adolescents. We need to urgently address the impact of the climate crisis on adolescent health and well-being. 
mental health, non-communicable diseases, climate change is changing adolescent health. Adolescents and young people are at the forefront of demanding change when it comes to the climate crisis. They are at the forefront of leading climate action. We need to leverage youth action and agency towards a sustainable future. With that, I would like to invite the first speaker for today's webinar, Professor Tony Capon. Tony is a huge proponent of intergenerational dialogue on climate and health. He truly champions young people, and I say that on behalf of all the people in the region that he works with, and also from my own personal experience of having the privilege of co-leading a work stream on climate change and health in the second Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. A quick plug of the commission just to say that, stay tuned. For the launch of our new report. The last one, as many of you know, had come out in 2016 and it continues to pave the way for adolescent health. So Tony doesn't really need an introduction, but I will still attempt to provide a brief one. Uh, Professor Tony Capon directs the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and holds a chair in planetary health in the School of Public Health and Preventive Medicine at Monash University, Australia. A public health physician and authority in environmental health and health promotion, his research focuses on urbanization, sustainable development, and human health. I now invite Tony to please share with us and reflect on the state of evidence in the region. Over to you, Tony. Thanks ever so much, Sarabi and colleagues. Great to be with you today. I'm just going to share my slides here. And as I do that, uh, acknowledging also the traditional owners of the land I'm on today here in Nam, Melbourne, in Australia, uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And really appropriate that we acknowledge the traditional owners because of the care for country over millennia. Uh, the responsibilities that Indigenous people have taken on uh, over millennia to consider the well-being of future generations, as Sarabi and others have said. So I'm just going to uh, speak for up to 12 minutes uh, to set the scene around climate change and health in the Asia-Pacific region. And I wanted to start with some images from the 2019-2020 bushfire season here in Australia. This picture is people sheltering on a beach south of Sydney. Here, uh, Sydney shrouded in smoke for months during that summer. Australia's capital in Canberra where people were wearing masks to protect themselves from bushfire smoke before we were regularly wearing masks to protect ourselves uh, from the pandemic virus. And these were the media headlines around uh, the world uh, during that Australian summer. Those fires made clear to us all that our climate has changed and it's harming our health and the health of all other living species on Earth. Our ecology colleagues have estimated that more than 3 billion animals uh, died in that fire season. Of course, Australia is just one country in the region. Here, an image from the cover of Time magazine uh, back in 2013 from Taklaban in the Philippines uh, following Typhoon Haiyan. And here, more recently in 2022, the devastating floods in Pakistan. These extreme events are evidence that our clim climate has changed. Importantly, Climate change and health is a social justice issue. These scaled maps of the world, scaled cartograms from our colleagues, uh, Jonathan Patz, and uh, from the Annals of 
global health back in 2015. Uh, this panel here, panel A in the figure, a scaled map of the world showing which countries are responsible for the carbon emissions that are already in the system. And you can see that the United States is scaled up, United Kingdom, Europe, and Japan. In the second panel, another scaled map of the world, uh, we're looking at the countries in the world where people are dying from the impacts of climate change. And you can see that it's almost the opposite of the first panel. Uh, the countries where people's health is already being affected, notably uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So those least responsible for climate change already the most affected. This infographic from the CDC in Atlanta is a useful way of understanding the spectrum of health impacts of climate change. So in the middle, we've got increasing carbon dioxide levels, rising temperatures in red, more extreme weather, rising sea levels. In the middle band are what we call determinants of health, extreme heat, severe weather, air pollution, uh, changes to vector ecology, increasing allergens, water quality impacts, water and food supply impacts, environmental degradation, and around the outside, the spectrum of health outcomes that our healthcare workers are already seeing, from heat-related illnesses on the left here, through uh, fatal injuries and mental health impacts from severe weather, uh, asthma and cardiovascular disease from air pollution, uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, respiratory and allergic disorders, uh, water quality impacts, uh, waterborne diseases, uh, water and food supply impacts, malnutrition uh, from prolonged drought, for example, environmental degradation, potentially leading to forced migration, civil conflict, and a, a wide range of mental health impacts. So these kind of infographics can be quite useful for illustrating that spectrum. Here's another schema for pathways between climate change and health. And uh, this one developed uh, with colleagues at Australian National University some years ago. You've got climate change on the left, health impacts on the right. Importantly, three broad categories of health impacts here. Uh, firstly, the direct health impacts, the ones that we saw in those uh, photographs at the beginning of my talk. Category two impacts are what we call indirect or system mediated impacts. And we can subgroup these into firstly, uh, changes to physical systems and processes. Here, urban air pollution is a classic example because during extreme heat, we get higher levels of ozone production at the ground level in cities and greater health risks. The second subcategory here changes to biological processes and timing. The emblematic example here is the changing abundance and distribution of the vectors of disease, such as mosquitoes and uh, dengue fever, for example, across the region. The third subcategory here is changes to ecosystem structure and function. And the classic example here is the spillover of novel pathogens, uh, like uh, uh, novel viruses that are occurring in the context of climate change, other environmental changes like forest clearance, uh, uh, removing the habitat of wild animals, meaning they come closer to where people are living, perhaps on the edge of fast growing cities and new opportunities for spillover between wild animals, uh, possibly through domestic animals to people. 
The third major category of health impacts of climate change is what we call flow on effects via socio economic and demographic disruption. This is an intersection between climate change and the social determinants of health. Uh, for example, uh, the, during prolonged drought, declining incomes of farmers affecting their mental health. And we're concerned about the health of farmers uh, here in Australia, uh, in India, for example, concerns about suicide rates uh, across our region. So these kinds of frameworks can be very helpful to keep the spectrum of challenges that we're facing together in mind. The annual report of the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change tracks a group of indicators globally and uh, looks at both the health impacts of climate change and what we're doing about it. I wanted to show th three examples from the most recent report. And here at the global level, exposure to hot weather and extreme heat. If there was no climate change, we would expect that on average, about 60 days uh, of exposure to hot weather and extreme heat. But you can see here uh, in the, the wider line, which is the global average exposure, has been increasing uh, during the last 20 plus years. And we've seen that consistently across the regions of the world, including our region. Change in the number of months of extreme drought per year over a 60 year period. And you can see here in red, uh, the parts of the world where we're seeing increasing number of months of extreme drought, uh, Africa, and South America, uh, very strong signals already also in our region. Uh, India, uh, parts of Southeast Asia as well, including Papua New Guinea and Australia. On the other side, uh, we're also tracking indicators of climate action. And here, the carbon intensity of the global energy system sent from 1970 uh, through to the present. And you can see that it has declined very modestly on average during this 50 year period. Uh, there's been a bigger decline in the higher uh, uh, human development index countries, these are the highest income countries, but there's still a long way to go in those countries. In other countries of the world, we've seen increases through this period, and that's understandable, of course. The only positive in this slide is you can see a trend, a downward trend in the most recent years, but it needs to accelerate if we are to meet uh, the Paris Agreement targets. A couple of final slides before I stop. Uh, this report on the imperative of climate action to promote and protect health in Asia was published in 2021. It's from the Association of Academies and Societies of Science in Asia. It's a useful resource and you can see on this slide where you can find that report if you'd like to look at it later. What does it mean for adolescent health? Well, this recent review uh, in May this year in the Journal of Global Health, led by colleagues from WHO in Geneva, found uh, a range of connections, uh, pathogens and vector-borne diseases, asthma and respiratory illnesses, impacts on nutrition and growth, security and safety, PTSD and other mental health issues, eco-anxiety, relationships and connectedness affected, and learning opportunities in our schools and other educational institutions. So we need to do more research in this area, but we're already seeing evidence. Final slide, uh, as you can see here, 
from today's Lancet at the bottom uh, of the slide. And uh, while it's a very depressing headline, woefully unprepared for the climate crisis, this is a new report uh, just out from the International Labour Organization about uh, the importance of social protection uh, to build resilience in communities. And uh, we're unprepared uh, in terms of access to healthcare and uh, social safety nets uh, in, in the most vulnerable countries. Let me stop there. Thanks very much, Sarabi. Happy to take questions later. Thank you so much, Tony, for your presentation. And I feel like we were able to get a quick overview of Climate and Health 101, I guess, at an exclusive Monash lecture by Tony. But I think on a serious note, um, we often face policymakers asking researchers for evidence for action when it comes to uh, climate and health. And I think you've provided a spectrum of latest publications, including the countdown, et cetera, to show the severity of emerging threats that are faced by adolescents, not tomorrow, but actually today. So really, thank you so much, Tony, for that. We will uh, ask, I'll ask all of the uh, people in the audience, I'm sure you have a bunch of questions for Tony, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll direct him his way towards the end. With that, I'll just move towards the next presentation. Uh, I'm honored to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Preeti Galagani. It's a privilege uh, for Meris, our co-chair, and I to be a part of the IWH Education Committee, which Dr. Preeti co-chairs with Risa. Dr. Preeti is a trailblazer and pioneer in the field of child and adolescent healthcare in India. In 2005, she was amongst the first group of pediatricians to be formally trained in adolescent medicine in India and is one of the few to offer exclusive comprehensive teen health services in the private sector. She is extensively trained in mental health care and counseling techniques. Let us all welcome Dr. Preeti to share her perspectives as a clinician through a presentation. How is the health of adolescents being affected by the climate crisis in the Asia Pacific countries? Over to you, Dr. Preeti. Uh, thank you so much, Rubi, for the wonderful introduction. Let me share my presentation. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Uh, we can go full Thank screen you. and we're good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let me talk about adolescent health and climate crisis from a pediatrician's perspective. So I thank Tony for setting the pace of this session. And in the next few minutes, I would just quickly share a few climate change facts, impacts on adolescent health, and what can we as a health professional and as a health professional organization do to mitigate and help in overcoming this crisis. So it's very well known that, and this was the latest kind of World Economic Forum Global Risk Perception Survey of 2023 and 2024. No surprises here, climate change is the top global risk. And no wonder, as Surbi said, the theme for the environmental Health World Day was litigation, adaptation, and risk reduction strategies. So we already heard what havoc climate change is causing to the environment in which the children are living. And a couple of years ago, you know, the famous Greta Thunberg, she said our house is on fire. And yes, really, it is. We are faced with a stark reality that the world is already 1.1 degree centigrade warmer than during the pre-industrial area levels, but further rises of between 1.5 and 3.5 degree as expected by the end of the century, depending on the scale and speed of climate change mitigation can really cause more havoc. So the Asia Pacific region is really housing the largest population of adolescents in the world and more so in India. And it is estimated that the youth of today will experience a seven fold increase in climate events and four times as many heat waves during their lifetimes than those born in 1960s. So youth are really in trouble here if we do not take care of climate change. Youth living in areas impacted by climate change may already be experiencing 
environmental injustices, depletion of resources, or living near waste hazards that adversely impact health. Nearly 90% of adolescents live in low middle income countries and their experience with the great rise in climate related exposures with vulnerabilities compounded by poverty, challenges of governance and conflict, marginalization due to gender, ethnicity, disability, low income and health inequity. Climate changes can result in humanitarian crisis in fragile settings. So we often talk about climate change, think global, but act local. But yes, there are local specific changes too. As you can see in the East, East Asia Pacific region, there are earthquakes, there are cyclones, there are droughts. And the youth in the Pacific islands, in fact, are facing an existential crisis when they are forced to migrate due to climate changes. Well, let me go back to the clinic. So I am a practicing clinician. I had this 15-year-old being referred to me for uncontrolled asthma. And to our surprise, when we took a detailed history, the head psychosocial history in private for offering confidentiality, she revealed that her father, who was a farmer, had recently committed suicide due to drought in his area and that with her mother, she was forced to shift to the city and she was living near this bus stop, which you can see can is really very much environmentally polluted. So this was a trigger for her asthma and also the stress caused due to the death of her father. So we managed this case by grief counseling and suggesting to the mother to shift the child to another place that is her grandfather who lived on the outskirts of Bangalore, which was less polluted. And these two steps helped us to control her asthma. Coming to another case, this 10 year old came with rhinosinusitis and we were treating him with antibiotics, but this just won't subside. And then there was a swelling on the nasal mucosa as well. And when you took a swab from there, it grew asparagulosis, that is fungus. And then when we took a history, we found out he and his family had migrated from Assam due to floods to the city and they had no place to live. So they were living in a slum area in a cow shed and there was mold growing in that cow shed. So they were sleeping there. And this was the one from where, though he was immunocompetent, there was no reason for him to get a fungal infection because of his living conditions caused due to a flood disaster in his area and shifting to the city in a cow shed was the reason for his problem. And when he was treated with amphotericin B, his sinusitis subsided. So as has been told by Professor Kappen, each domain of adolescent well-being is affected by the climate change. So health, connectedness, safety, learning, agency, and resilience. I want you to pay special attention to adolescent girls. Adolescent girls in low middle income countries are more likely than boys to go hungry after climate related disasters. The psychological distress, nostalgia, uncertainty, and anxiety caused by extreme weather events adversely impacts the mental well-being of adolescents. Family migration, as we saw in both the cases that I dis discussed before, and separation due to natural disasters leads to loss of connectedness. This results in an unsafe living environment, exposure to armed conflict, gender-based violence, trafficking, conflict, exploitation, and child marriage. Extreme weather events may also result in closure of schools, loss of learning, and school dropouts. Agency and resilience of adolescents is affected when they notice a dissonance between government responses and actions needed in earnest to deal with climate crisis. In a recent survey of over 10,000 young people aged 16 to 25 years in 10 countries, over 50% of the adolescents said that they felt anxious, afraid, and powerless in the face of climate crisis. So there's lots for us to do. And as 
health professionals, as pediatricians and as adults and health specialists, we are fam very familiar with the psychosocial history taking. So I think it's time to add another E to heads and that goes by environmental history. I think it's extremely important for us to gather information about the surroundings of the client, including physical, psychological, social environment, and presence of hazards, pollutants, and safety measures. And we know how climate change is having an impact on food insecurity. So it's also time to add a screening tool for food insecurity, and this tool called the feeding, Food Insecurity Experience Scale is an excellent tool which should be added to routine history taking. Having said that, can we do something more? We as professionals often give anticipatory guidance regarding various health issues to adolescents in clinical practice. How about we adding this about asking them what is climate change? How can it affect the health? What can you do? Can you use bicycles instead of going out in the car? Can you take care to segregate waste? Refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, unplug chargers, save the environment and speak up. So environment education is going to be a key and we as clinicians can even offer it in our own clinics, developing an environment friendly attitude, the ability to do action and of course, awareness. Now, SAN, Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine and the International Association of Adolescent Health position paper is about to be published in a couple of weeks. And here, I'm one of the co-authors, and we're here we have talked about what health professionals and organizations could do. So we have focused on an accountable rights-based approach to prevention, mitigation, and adaption. A lot of advocacy, ensuring that there's access to health services by those whose lives have been disrupted by climate change and health facilities and health systems themselves should minimize their adverse climate impacts and be role models. And we should pursue environmental responsible investment strategies. And all health professionals at both undergraduate and postgraduate level must have training and education, and of course, we encourage research in the field. So we, do, we also take the onus of responsibility to do our bit for the climate and all the time partnering, partnering and understanding that the youth are today and our future, and we would like to collaborate and partner with them. Just to give you an example, the Indian Academy of Pediatrics has an environment and child health group and they have initiated a green army for schools in nearly 30 schools all over the country where pediatricians go and give education regarding saving the environment and empowering the children to grow trees, to maintain a vegetable garden in their school, to be more nature sensitive and enhance their environmental quotient. Not only this, the academy has also having guidelines on how to make the conferences more environmental friendly and insisting everybody to carry their own steel bottles rather than use the plastic bottles. So small things like this, I think, can go a long way in helping the climate crisis. So the key points that I wanted to convey is that pediatricians and adolescent health professionals should adopt a rights, justice, and equity-based approach to counter the effects of climate change. We have a number of roles as health professionals. We should definitely screen and manage health effects. We must link the vulnerable to social services, which is extremely important. Anticipatory guidance. We must play a major role in disaster mitigation as well and helping those disaster teams community-based environmental education, and advocate for adolescent-friendly policies at the governmental level and change in the medical curriculum as well. And we should be role models, decrease the greenhouse gas emissions by health systems, 
promote research and publish Polish position statements regarding climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. And of course, we can't do it alone. We need the support of both local and global youth-led systems and groups like you to help us with sustainable solutions and programs. So thank you. And I would like to end with this comment from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2023. The severity of climate-related health risks is dependent on how health systems and professionals can protect people. So let's do it. Let's do it together. Go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Preeti, for your presentation. Thanks so, so much for highlighting the burden of disease that's linked to climate change. I think clinicians and adolescent health professionals in the audience could resonate with the stories uh, that you shared from your own clinical practice. Thank you so much for doing that. It was also very interesting to note that how Tony and you both brought a social justice lens to this discussion. And I think that's really important for us to remember. Now, with that, I am glad to introduce our final speaker for the session, uh, who will share her perspective as a youth advocate and one of our region's front-running leaders in adolescent health, Sadia Rahman. I first met Sadia uh, when she delivered the opening remarks of the uh, at the inaugural ceremony for the Fifth International Conference on Family Planning. And a quote from her that has stuck with me ever since is that she said, Mahatma Gandhi had five sons who remembers them, but Nehru had one and she changed the face of India. So she inspired everyone in the audience with that statement, but also her personal story of how she demanded an education for herself. And I will always remember that. And so will all the audience members present there to uh, witness your remarks. So thanks so much for joining us today, Sadia. Sadia Rahman is the manager of Youth and Adolescent Partnerships at the FP 2030 Asia and the Pacific Hub. She has extensive experience in the field of youth development and has worked with several organizations, including the Center for Reproductive Rights, the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning, and many more. Sadia is a strong advocate for youth participation in decision-making and has worked to ensure that the voice of young people is heard in global conversations around reproductive health. I would now like to invite Sadia to share her perspectives on the role of adolescent and youth movements in addressing the health impact of the climate crisis on, ad on adolescents and young people of the region. Over to you, Sadia. Thank you, Sadia. It's, it's really great to hear. We still remember the quote from 2018. Um, thank you so much for having me. I was uh, listening to Tony and then Dr. Preeti to you. I think you have set the... Uh, tone of this webinar on the very right note. I just want to add with both of you uh, that today I want to begin by setting the stage for a reality that affects all of us, right? And especially young people across Asia and the Pacific. Um, the climate crisis is not a looming threat and climate change is not something that is going to happen after 30 or 40 years. It's happening right now. And uh, it's here, it's now, in, and it's reshaping our lives, our landscapes and futures. And countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, and Pacific Island countries um, are at the forefront experiencing devastating floods, rising sea levels, and extreme heat waves. So these events are not isolated. Uh, they're part of a growing pattern of intensified natural disasters hitting our region. And uh, for example, in Bangladesh, recent flood in northern um, area have displaced millions and often uh, rendering young women and girls are, are more vulnerable. As Tony said, in Pakistan in 2022, the floods devastated entire communities, leaving behind an alarming rise in health emergencies and especially among women of reproductive age. And India has seen unprecedented heat waves putting a strain on healthcare systems and, and Pacific Island countries face um, extension, existential threats, uh, existential threats uh, from uh, rising sea levels with uh, young people often having, often having to uh, migrate in search of safer ground. 
So the effect of uh, climate change are not just environmental. They um, exacerbate existing vulnerabilities, especially for young women and girls. And data shows that Asia-Pacific countries have faced on average six natural disasters a year over the past three decades. And a, a staggering figure compared to other regions of the world. And, and during any crisis, 25% of the affected population is of reproductive age while one in five internally displaced or refugee women have experienced sexual violence. So imagine um, a young girl in a, in a remote village already struggling with access to education and health care, now facing displacement due to flooding. And, and her vulnerabilities multiply, right? Uh, we are adding to that that the struggle of a life and access to essential reproductive health services becomes a distant reality. For every crisis affected population, about 4% will be pregnant and a staggering 15% of those women will face pregnancy related complications. So these are not just data, it's a harsh reality that many young women are living right now when we are sitting in our homes and talking about it. So uh, amidst these challenges, there are hopes. There are professors like Tony, there are doctors like Preeti, and there are young professionals like all of you who has joined this webinar today. So there's hope and there are opportunities to turn adversity into action. And, and that's where I will say FP2030, the organization I am working currently comes in. Um, at FP2030, we are committed to an emergency preparedness response strategy that uses all hazard approach and encouraging governments to invest in strategies that build resilience in the face of climate change. Our niche lies in uh, creating a collaborative platform that brings together humanitarian development and national actors uh, to enhance um, preparedness and resilience at both global and local levels. Um, thank you for uh, Emma adding in the chat that Philippines has faced multiple typhoons in the last few years. And I have colleagues in Philippines who often report on that and they uh, they struggle with connectivity issue and other, other challenges that comes with these uh, natural disasters. And we uh, in FP2030, as I was saying, we believe in facilitating connections between diverse actors, utilizing our network to ensure that young people have a voice, a seat at the table, and access to the services they deserve. It's encouraging to see that over 75% of our FP2030 commitment-making countries have integrated EPL strategies as, as part of their commitments uh, with the Asia-Pacific region leading the way. Um, as, so this shows a strong regional dedication to ensuring that the impact of climate change doesn't strip away the rights and opportunities of our youth. Now, more than ever, we need cross-sectoral programs and funding streams that address the complex realities of people, especially young people uh, who are living in these climate vulnerable areas. They must be empowered to continue their education, secure livelihoods, maintain good health, including access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So um, also we need to go local, uh, we need to connect with local organizations, local youth-led initiatives, because they are the one who are living in that reality. They know what works in their community. They know the language, they know the people, they know the place. Um, I was in one of the districts of Bangladesh called Shatkhira, where the salinity of the um, uh, water has increased so much. Uh, young women invited me uh, for lunch at their home and she was quoting like that that I can I can invite you for lunch but I can't give you water to drink when I invite you for lunch because the the drinking water has so much saline in it they have to walk every day three to five uh three to five hours every day to collect waters from a safe and which is unsalted which is drinkable so I call upon you all of you today to recognize that this is not just a climate crisis. It's a human crisis, a crisis of health, rights, and dignity. And our response must be holistic 
inclusive and driven by the voices and needs of young people. There is no such program, that is, there is no such policy that can be designed, that can be um, addressed without young people on the table. And when I say young people on the table, that has to be meaningful engagement, not just having them in the table and not having a voice there. So uh, let's build a future where every young person, regardless of where they live or the challenges they face, has the opportunity to thrive in a world that's resilient, equitable, and just. So together we have the power to create change, to rewrite stories, and to build a future that uh, respects and protects the rights of all. Um, I think that's it, Suravi. I'll keep it short. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Sagar. Thank you so much for your inspiring remarks. And um, I can, I'm can i sure everyone can understand why uh, I'm a huge fan of hers, because she sets a constant reminder to all generations about the need for every adolescent and young person. We need to give them the ability to make accurate, informed discussions. And it can't just be tokenistic representation. We have to move towards meaningful youth engagement. So thank you so much, Sagar, for that reminder for all of us. We with that, I think we'll move into the Q&A. We've been getting a few questions for different speakers. Uh, just a quick reminder to all those who are attending the webinar, please use the Q&A function to drop questions you have for the speakers. I'll just quickly start us off uh, with a question for Tony. Uh, Tony, as we all know that young people in Fiji and the Pacific Islands are at the forefront of demanding climate action. They have really... Um, set inspirational uh, examples of how young people can make adults accountable for their actions. Could you share a few more insights from your work with young people in Fiji and the Pacific Islands? Thanks uh, very much, Saravi. Yeah, as um, has been highlighted, including by Sadia, the small island countries in the Pacific are really on the front line of climate change, uh, confronting inundation regularly, and including uh, hospitals. Uh, at uh, COP28 in Dubai, we had a session uh, in the Monash Pavilion with the Permanent Secretary for Health from Tuvalu. And she explained that in the hospital there in Tuvalu, they regularly have to move the patients from the ground floor where the wards are up to the second floor, which is usually offices because of inundation. And this, as uh, Sadia and Preeti have said, uh, climate change is already happening. It's not a future issue. And young people, uh, Surabi, as you say, speaking out, uh, Fiji, a strong voice uh, in the UN climate change processes. And uh, we need uh, young people, we need to support our young people uh, to advocate uh, for change. So yeah, I, I might just stop there. I'm conscious that I've had to walk um, here in Melbourne to my next meeting. I'll just put my mic back off. But thank you very much for the question, Sarabi. Thanks so much, Tony. And we appreciate uh, you answering that question despite being on the move. Thank you so much. Um, I think I have a, another follow-up question for uh, Dr. Preeti. I really uh, think that some of the tools that you shared were really helpful, like in terms of how we need to think about environmental health when we do uh, uh, the practice of history taking in clinical settings, et cetera. And you talked a bit about curriculum as well. So I would love for you to reflect on how do you see climate change uh, being introduced to the current curriculum when it comes to adolescent health professionals? Do you think it's keeping pace with the way in which climate change is impacting our health or is it lagging behind? Uh, like uh, what uh, uh, Professor Tony had shown, the last article, we are woefully behind. Yes, sadly, we are woefully behind as well as uh, about training also in medical education. But recently there was an article on a competency-based you know, we are all talking about a competency-based curriculum in medical education. 
So the curriculum is designed in such a way to ensure that certain competencies are built up. So recently, very, very recently, we had an article which talked about a competency-based curriculum in climate change for health professionals. So we hope and we start pushing it in now in various health professional organizations that they should be included at the state level. As we can see, a lot of problems are, are very much local, you know. So just having the outline is enough, but again, it has to be kind of individualized and personalized for every country. So I think a beginning has been made and I'm sure change is there. And with more of or more of young professionals like you kind of speaking up for it, I'm sure change is just around the corner. Thank you so much, Dr. Preeti. And uh, I'd be curious if there are people in uh, the audience today, if you have seen any such practices in your curriculum, please feel free to share that. We know that other youth groups like IFMSA, et cetera, have been working towards advocating for climate change uh, to be introduced in health curriculum. So that's really encouraging to hear, Dr. Preeti, that things are changing. Um, I'll move uh, with the next question to Sadhya. Uh, Sadhya, just in case uh, people don't know, just to share that one of the climate solutions she had come up with was the School of Impossible, which was working to empower adolescents, girls and boys from climate vulnerable areas to get uh, sexual reproductive health information, climate information through different art forms. Um, so I think these kind of climate solutions are so important to highlight uh, that are coming from young people. So Sadhya, just how do you feel we can, and I know you spoke a bit about the role of funders, etc. as well, and uh, how do you think that we can uh, get more support for young people, move the needle from tokenism to meaningful engagement to support the sustainability of climate solutions that young innovative minds like you are coming up for? Thank you, Shobha. I think that's, that's a very uh, uh, interesting question about climate financing, which is a critical issue right now when uh, every year uh, there are some debates and I would say if I can articulate that more correctly, uh, controversies like where is this financing coming from? How green is that money? So um, um, focusing on those, I think if I need to um, address your question, how to engage young people more meaningfully. As I said in my speech as well, to connect with local communities, locally led initiatives, School of Impossible is something where we connected with uh, local youth-led organizations who are working on the coastal belts of Bangladesh. And not only we um, so addressed the SRHR issue or family planning issue of young people, you also addressed the mental health issue. Because I think mental health is one of uh, the pressing issue that climate change, uh, with climate change, it's emerging and it's really interlinked as like SIHR. Um, I, we have seen um, climate refugees displaced to bigger cities in Bangladesh, uh, living in slums who doesn't have uh, access to wash. There is only, there's a big slum where 5,000 people are living together and then there is only one wash area with one uh, toilet which is not uh, even safe for women and girls to access. And when there is only one wash, one, one shower area, young, young girls and women doesn't feel safe to take their shower there. So these this issues, so it's not only, as I said, the salinity in the water is increasing. And there is a, rec a recent study that shows um, um, young teenage girls, like 13 to 14 years girls, are taking regularly birth control pills to manage their uh, menstruation. Because when the when they are water clogged, they don't have a uh, proper facility to, they use clothes, right? So they don't have access to sanitary pads as well. So they don't have access to uh, safe water where they can uh, wash their those clothes and dry them and use them so they prefer to stop their menstruation so these are alarming uh cases that we can only get from the community when we work with them when you go to them because this climate change is happening because of the policies that uh someone um, um just just decided to have in place and we are the one we are the young people to 
to be part of it, to, to realize the reality of it in this totality, right? So if you want to tackle, if you want to come up with resilience, if you want to come up with solutions to tackle this climate crisis, it has to be the young people, it has to be the communities who are suffering with it. And I think uh, when you um, go to the root, the, the solution also relies in those communities. Because as I said, they know their place, they, they know their language, they know their leaders. You just have to assist them with technical assistance, with financing, and they are asking it um, not not like an aid aid, I don't know, but th this, this is something we have caused to them. So this is our responsibility. We have to be accountable to tackle those. They, they, they shouldn't be calling us. We should be calling them to the table, be there and address this together. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sadia, for sharing that. And I think Bangladesh, specifically in this region, we can see why it has been the most one of the most effective countries affected countries, but at the same time, a big leader in the kind of solution it comes up with and centering communities within that solutions has also been so important. So Sadia, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm mindful that we just have five minutes left. With that, I would just quickly do a last round of question. And it's the same question for all of our panelists, which is what would be your key message for all of the emerging professionals attending this webinar today when it comes to addressing the health impacts of the climate crisis on adolescent health. Uh, can I start with uh, Dr. Preeti? I hope Tony can also answer. Okay, we have Tony. So I'll go in the same pattern, uh, starting with Tony. Thanks very much, Sarabi. Um, yes, in terms of what uh, uh, adolescent health professionals can do now, I think the key message from my point of view is that for all of us as health professionals, uh, there is something we can do. And it's really about thinking deeply, talking to your colleagues, connecting with others, and finding the thing that is relevant to your practice, to the work you do. And we shouldn't think of um, uh, climate change uh, as a separate issue. It's something that we can all contribute to. And uh, it's about finding that uh, and finding the support of your peers to advance it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony, for that powerful message. Passing it on to Dr. Preeti. Well, in medicine, we often talk about primary prevention, secondary and tertiary prevention. The same holds good for climate change. Prevent the change if there are problems, manage them, and if there is a disaster, ensure rehabilitation. rehabilitation. So that's what I would tell the young people. Ensure that climate change is a part of medical curriculum and that we all do it together, keeping always in mind meaningful youth engagement. Thank you so much for that inspiring message, Dr. Preeti. And uh, to end with the most powerful youth speaker we have, Sadhya. Uh, I think my call would be uh, engage young people as equal partners uh, and the the young professionals, I'm a young professional too. So uh, the experience I can share is ask for they call it, uh, ask for they call partnership. If you don't ask it, you won't get it. So ask for equal partnership, make your way, have uh, enrich your knowledge, read and uh, get part of researches because we need young researchers as well. Um, so yeah, this is it. And I, I would say, get involved in equal partnerships. Don't compromise or just to be added uh, as, as a token in the table, but get equal. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sadia, for those inspiring words that we should all remember and put into practice as young people uh, and also older people who are working with young people to make sure we're not tokenistic in engagement. So with that, thanks to all of our speakers for taking the time to share your insights. We've learned a lot. I'll pass over to uh, our co-chair, Stephanie, to wrap up the session. 
I'd just like to say thank you so much again for such a wonderful webinar that we've had this evening. I know I've learned so much. Um, it was wonderful to sort of make, make new connections. And I think the chat was really exciting as well, um, just seeing where everyone was calling in from. So thank you so much. So just two quick slides from me. Um, please join our WhatsApp community. Uh, we have a vibrant um, community. Um, we have lots of different channels that you can join um, based on your region, your interests, your professional background. Um, so please, there's the... Um, the QR code, you can scan that and uh, join join our WhatsApp community. I'd also like to just give a quick shout out that um, in November 2025, we have the 13th World Congress on Adolescent Health, and this is being held in Jamaica, um, which is really exciting. Um, so abstract and workshop submissions are now open. So we would encourage you to check out the, the website and hopefully put something together, um, hopefully some more incredible sessions around um, adolescent health and climate change because we as we heard today we really need that continued advocacy so with that I'd like to thank everyone so much for your time this evening uh, and end the webinar so thank you so much